Hello everyone in the room and also a warm welcome to the audience joining us online. Um, this is our Dialogues in Development that is focused on local actions shaping urban environmental trajectories in the Global South. Over the last few decades, we've seen urban environmental issues in the Global South attracting increasing attention in policy planning and research. And the DPU has been at the forefront of challenging mainstream thinking and exploring environmentally sustainable approaches and solutions that are just and inclusive through action-oriented research, teaching, training and advisory services. Today's event is part of the DPU's Dialogues in Development series that celebrates our department's 70th anniversary. And in particular, we want to use the opportunity to explore how the work of David Satterthwaite has contributed to the DPU and shaped wider urban environmental debates and practices. So some of you might wonder about the photo that we used to advertise this event, which we also see on the slide here. It shows David together with Jokin Arputa, the former leader of the National Slum Dwellers Federation in India, sitting on a children's toilet built by the federations of the urban poor. And in fact, when we were digging for that picture, which many of us remember from some of David's presentations, he actually told us the story that when they were posing for the photo, that some children asked that actually to make it a real picture, he should be pulling down his trousers. <laughs> Um, so, um, <coughs> Chokin has been a, a key influence in David's work and they both shared a passion for community-driven processes. As many of you will know that have known and worked with David for many years, he is a senior associate at the International Institute for Environment and Development, where he has worked since the 1970s. At the beginning, he worked for Barbara Ward, a British economist and founder of IIED, before joining Horka Hardoy as an assistant in IIED's human settlement program. David would later head the program himself for several years. David's connection with the DPU goes all the way back to the 1970s when he was actually a student himself on one of DPU's short courses before becoming a close collaborator for decades to come and being appointed visiting professor at UCL in 2010. So it's not our aim uh, today to provide a comprehensive picture of David's work as a whole in this short event, uh, nor all of his contributions to the field of urban environment. But we have instead identified three themes that we feel encapsulate key concerns in David's work and in his collaboration with the DPU, and we will use these to help structure today's conversation. These three themes are, firstly, urbanization and the growing importance of small and intermediate urban centers. Secondly, community-driven approaches, knowledge creation by urban poor movements, and partnerships with local government. And thirdly, understanding risk and climate change in urban areas and the intersection of the green and brown agendas. The session today will be organized with two speakers on each theme and we're very lucky to have uh, two speakers who've uh, traveled to be here with us, Celine de Cruz and David Dodman. And each theme will be followed by a short intervention from David on some questions we've asked him or we will ask him. Uh, and we have time at the end of the session for questions and comments from the audience, so we welcome those and please think as you're listening. And we'd like to invite all of those of you who are in the room uh, to stay a little longer with us at the end uh, to socialize and in the back we've brought some drinks and uh, nibbles, so we hope that you will uh, stay at six and have a drink with us um, before you depart. So I'm going to, without any further ado, we start the, uh, the talks. The first one I'm going to pass over to uh, Don, who's uh, on Zoom uh, with David at his residence. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Cassidy for and Pascal, for the introduction. Um, so this theme is dedicated to um, 
the contributions that uh, David's made to the work on urbanization and the specifically the growing importance of small and intermediate um, urban centers. So I'm very grateful to be sitting with, here with uh, with David beside me. I hope you can all you can all see me. Um, so in this short talk, I want to tell you a story about how David has influenced the DPU's commitment to socially just and sustainable development of the global south, but through uh, more of a, a personal um, example. Um, my intention is not simply to list David's many contributions to the DPU, but rather to provide an example of how David has worked to bring people together across diverse geographic and social boundaries. Um, and as an entry point, the theme for this talk, as mentioned, looks at uh, urbanization and smaller urban centers. And the smaller urban centers have always been central to David's work, which has placed, um, played an important role in helping to shift the debate uh, really away from a focus on the largest uh, urban centers. Uh, the shift has been uh, the subject of growing interest within the DPU, especially within our long-standing work on rural urban linkages um, and peri-inter-face, um, peri and also more recently, small town growth and, and overlooked cities. Okay, um, now for the personal side. Um, I first came to the DPU in 2011 as an MSc student. Uh, before then, I was a freshly minted urban planner uh, working in a small city in Malawi called Mizuzu. At the time, um, Azusa's population was around 128,000, uh, and today its population has nearly doubled to about 220,000. And this is a familiar story for many smaller urban centers. While working in Mizuzu, um, I shared an office at a local university with one of David's former students named Mutafu. Um, I think he's on the call here as well. Um, and one of the first uh, most striking features of Mutafu's office um, that I first observed was a long line of green looking books on his shelf. Soon I would learn that these were in fact issues of the journal Environment Urbanization or ENU for short, which uh, David uh, co-created with uh, the help of among others, Julio, who will speak um, next after me. Um, as a close friend and mentor, Mtafu handed me issues of ENU to read as I came to grips with working in a small African city with a rapidly growing population um, with high levels of poverty and informality. And in the process, I was exposed to much of David's seminal work um, on the world's urban transition and its underpinnings, which is now the subject of David's highly popular IID blog series, which all of you should go in and check out if you haven't already. Um, like countless others, uh, David's work played a seminal role in motivating me to come to the DPU for a, a master's, and I was very thrilled to have David uh, as my, my teacher. Um, having graduated, I had the privilege of working with David alongside David Dobbin, who will speak later, Cassidy, who will speak later, among others, uh, as part of a Project Africa Risk Knowledge, or Urban Arc for short. So as a PhD student um, on the project, I found myself working back in Malawi, this time working on urban risk in a small town called Karunga. Um, I was motivated by David's analysis of census data, indicating that around half of sub-Saharan Africa's urban population lives in urban centers with less than 500,000 inhabitants, including a large share in small towns like Karunga. David's work um, on the spectrum of risk has inspired a great deal of research in the DPU, um, as Cassidy will dis discuss um, later on. So David's work on, on small and intermediate urban centers stems back to 1986, when he, together with uh, Jorge Hordoy, uh, co-authored a seminal book focused on Africa, Asia, and Latin America. In that year, David co-edited uh, or co-led uh, a short course with Michael Safier on smaller urban centers in the DPU, addressing a neglected aspect of the curricula and urban literature uh, more broadly. Um, since then, David's work has continued to influence a large and growing body of urban research and teaching across the DPU's seven uh, MSc programs, 
notably the MSC uh, Environment uh, and Sustainable Development Program that that Cass, um, sorry that Pascal will speak about um, later on. Um, our most recent program is MSC Health and Urban Development, HED for short, which is heavily dis inspired by David's work on health in an urbanizing world. Books such as The Poor Die Young, Squatter Citizen, and Environmental Problems in Urbanizing World have been especially influential in much of our teaching as well as research in ESD and in other programs concerned with urban environmental problems. In the HUD, uh, HUD module that I teach, um, David's contributions are evidenced by numerous publications by himself and colleagues featured in the reading list, uh, many published in ENU, which can, continues to ser serve as an invaluable teaching resource for many of us here at the DPU. Um, as a personal thing, uh, David's work has helped me to teach students about the links between urban health, environment, and development, and how communities working uh, in partnership with local government and civil society can work to address many of these so-called social determinants of health in the, the urban uh, environment. Um, <clears throat> this talk is not meant about me, uh, about me, nor is it necessarily uh, about David. It's more about the countless relationships that David has cultivated uh, in response to an increasingly urbanizing world while asking us to broaden our geographic focus, uh, question the stats, and acknowledge and support communities and grassroots uh, responses. Um, to me, David's contribution to the D DPU cannot be um, seen as independent of the many people he has inspired, taught, and worked with. And, and I am just one among so many uh, examples, and I'm privileged to have uh, David's to be my friend and my, my colleague. So, um, thank you for a lovely introduction. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, I want to kick it back to Julio. Um, so, Prof. Julio uh, de Villa is a professor um, of urban policy and international development here at the, the DPU and has known David Long. Much much before my 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 days, but was also working with with David at the um, at IID. Um, so I want to ask Julio, um, you a little bit about what the discourse was like on urbanization during the nineteen eighties uh, when David joined the DPU, um, and how the, David's work has helped to shift the discourse towards the urban. Don, thank you so much uh, for that lovely introduction. Thank you to you and Pascal for inviting me, for organizing this. I, I wrongly called it in a LinkedIn posting a Festschrift. The Festschrift is really a written piece of work, and Pascal will turn me off because she's a German speaker. But, uh, but this is a, the nearest of Festschrift we can do at this stage. Yeah, we, the book will come later, I hope. Uh, but David, uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, uh, but you know, this is this is your celebration, and I'm delighted to be here. You've been a friend of old. Uh, you've been a mentor, and I learned huge amounts from working with you. Just to put it in context, and it's going to be a little. You have to put up with me a little bit because it's going to be very self-indulgent. Uh, so I joined uh, IID in the summer of 1984. That reveals my age. Uh, when I was doing my master's. And that was when I started working on my dissertation. David, I met because he was a, what we called a DPU, the DPU called that, a junior tutor. Uh, of course, that's not very politically correct these days. So anyway, there were people who taught us to, to read and write effectively. Uh, particularly people like, um, like me, who was a civil engineer, who knew nothing about writing. And there were plenty of architects who know very little about writing. So it was a, actually a fantastic little module, which is an add-on that we could do in small workshops. So David was my teacher, and it was, it was an enormous pleasure to be, to be taught by David uh, and, and his, his rigor. I mean, I think rigor is a, a, a subject that, are, well, rather a concept that you, know, can, you can easily get time to David. Apart from fun, David is a lot of fun to work with. Uh, so this is, as I said, a self-indulgent look at uh, my, the books I have at home, and. The, that have inspired me, and a little bit of a quick look at uh, the, the how the, in response to Don's question, 
how the the subject has evolved in some way. So you know, you've got fabulous books like the classic slum, which was a self-reflecting piece of work in the early 20th century, written by somebody who had actually grown in what Engels called the classic slum. So it's a it's a it's a classic book about the, the slum. Then, then of course there's there's the death and life of great American cities. Louis Montfort was also very influential. These are the people that I was reading. Uh, and of course, I, I then looked for John Turner's books, but it, I remember then that I came across John Turner when I was doing my engineering undergrad in Colombia, and I found his work in the British Library, um, the British Council Library, and I took them out and read them all in one go. They were absolutely wonderful. It changed my life. I said, I have to study with this man. And that's the reason why I ended up in DPU. When I got to DPU, John was gone. Uh, which is a shame. So I don't have his books because I, I took them out of a library of British Council. So I had to write them down, these two, Housing by People and Freedom to Build. Peter Hall was also a very influential figure, of course, a professor here at UCL who died um, about 10 years ago. But he was writing very much about the, if you like, the developed world. And of course, I had come across, uh, well before I was undergraduate, no, actually my first year of undergraduate degree when I was in the US, of uh, come across this book by a guy called Jorge Roy, and that's a strange name. And, and this is a classic, which is a, a distillation of his PhD research, Urban Planning in Pre-Columbian America. Fabulous book. Jorge was an architect, did his PhD in, in Harvard, and, uh, and then wrote about Pre-Columbian planning, which was a completely wild idea. Nobody had ever written about this. And Jorge was a historian but also somebody who, was, who brought in a, a very keen political eye to contemporary societies. But also he was, a, he was an architect who he had a very uh, good observation of space and, and cities and inequalities. And of course, uh, Kingsley um, uh, Davis put together this reading list, which I, I, I don't know how he got it. I think I, when we disbanded the, the DPU library, I just took that copy because it had been very important. But you know, their, their copies, he was disbanded, they were going. So I, I didn't steal it from anybody. <laughs> Don't laugh at it. Um, and and they, it has classic pieces, including one by Turner and Manjin about Lima's, Lima's um, self, if you like, informal settlement. Next. So and then, then uh, this was all pre-1970, if you like, or pre-1960, 75. Then came a whole load of influential books when I was already here about to come to the UK to study at DPU. Did, I did the then diploma course, which existed and disappeared, and then the Masters in Urban Development Plan, which was the only Masters we had at the time. And uh, Cities of Peasants, some of you may remember Karen uh, and others, but uh, Karen Moser, which are a fabulous book, which was sort of one of very influential book in sort of telling the story of migration and how you know, recent migration to cities. Uh, for me, Charles Gore's Regions in Question was also wonderful because he sort of he, he looked at regional development in many ways. Uh, there were people like um, Violich, Violich uh, working on urban planning in Latin America, and, and eventually, uh, and then there were, there were the historians. Uh, Jose Luis Romero is one of my favorite books ever. I don't know if it's been translated into English, but it's an absolute jewel. It's written by a, one of the top um, historians in Latin America. Uh, and this is a, a, a brilliant history. Oops, sorry. Brilliant history of of Latin American cities. Uh, and and Buenos Aires, the Centro de Barrios, was probably David will correct me if I'm wrong, but in my estimation, was probably Jorge Ardoy's favorite book ever. And it's a fantastic uh, narration, description, or, or analysis of the growth of Buenos Aires from that tiny village to the metropolis that it was when he wrote it, which was in 1960. And, and Fiori, uh, Fiori, of course, knew, knew um, Scobie, who was the, the author of the time. Um, and out of, uh, so the, we're talking about 1980s. And, and then I joined in 1984 um, Jorge who, and David, who invited me to work with him. And I was hugely flattered. I hadn't even uh, finished my dissert master's dissertation. I worked with them. And I stayed in IE for, for seven years. And, and then started you know, this fabulous um, production of, of reflections, which were based on a lot of this. I mean, David will probably correct me, and Karen, people who have a, a longer view uh, of this, will maybe have their own side of the story. But, but their take on uh, 
what was happening in cities was a very different one. It was, it was much more precise. It was, it was looking at the statistics. It was looking at the evidence as much as possible, but also telling a story which was more accessible. So Earthscan, which uh, Squatter Citizen, and that picture on the cover of Squatter Citizen is mine, by the way. So I am, I am the, I'm not the Squatter Citizen, but I took it in, in Pereira in, in, um, uh, years ago. Barrio Cuba, it's called. Uh, and then that was a, a, a version of it was Argoyen Sartreveta, Ciudad Legal, and Ciudad Legal. Next. Uh, and at the time, there were no journals dealing with cities, apart from these two, if I remember correctly. Karen Liu and David may correct me if I'm wrong. But, but cities had been founded in April, in, sorry, in 1983, I think, if you look at volume two, maybe 84. Uh, and, and Jorge and David were advisors to it, and Jorge came up with the idea of the profiles of cities, so which they took on, so we had a lot of things. Then, you know, for a number of years, one of my pictures was also on the cover of cities, which then, you know, nobody ever sees covers of journals anymore, because it's all digital. And then Third World Planning Review, which was very much focused on sort of post-colonial planning. It's very interesting, published by Liverpool University Press. Now it's got a different name, TCP, I think. Um, next. So the idea came to Jorge in Buenos Aires. He had already gone back and he came occasionally and sort of stayed here. It was, he, he, had a, he was a wonderful man, very warm, very witty, uh, expansive, and, and, and fabulous to work with. Uh, but he always had to take his siesta. So no, you couldn't walk into David's office because there would be these long leg, not leg, he wasn't that tall, but you know, these legs sticking out of under David's desk for about at least 15 minutes because what he was taking his yes, so everybody had to tiptoe around. Um, and, but, so all this was communication via fax, essentially. If the young people in the room will not know what a fax machine is, but you know, I can tell you later <laughs> with the tricks. You know, it's ancient technology. Uh, and Jorge came with the idea that we needed to do a version of Medio Ambiente y Urbanización in English. And he just wanted us to translate the articles. Now, I'll, I'll show you, and Dave, you'll be amazed to see this, if you can see it. I found, just before coming here, which is why it's not in the pictures, because these are the books I have at home, in my office, the volume one, number one of Medio Ambiente Urbanization. And that's a, that's a, I, I bet, you know, ID in Latin America doesn't even have it. Uh, this is, this is an incunable. This is really, you know, a collector's item. But it shows how it is. It's very, 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 excuse me, uh, colleagues in Latin America, very provincial. Uh, uh, in the sense that it's written for a small audience of very uh, engaged, politically engaged activists writing about issues which were, of course, very important, but it was a tiny, even Southern Cohen kind of thing. So uh, Jorge said, why don't we do a version of this? And uh, David and I started working on this. And it took us months and months and months. And I came across this uh, memorandum, which you can't see, but it's from May 1988. That's when we started, about maybe a month earlier, working on it. And I, this is a memo by me to Jorge Ila uh, Herzl, David and um, uh, what's his name? Kate uh, Sebag Montefiore was working with us at the time. It's wonderful people. My, my ideas of what the, the journal should look like, you know, what it should contain, and so on, having done a lot of it. I got the IESSN number for, from the British Library for, for the. And I have the first number as well, the first issue of Volume 1, Number 1 of Environment and Organization. Uh, and this is this is photocopy. This is you know sort of high technology. Essentially, <laughs> my 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 head was this photograph, photocopy, and sort of stuck onto. It. So all was artisanal. It was actually done together. We in, it, we edited everything. And the idea of this was actually to give a voice to practitioners in the global south, in developing countries, or middle and low income countries, whatever. And if you look at the the the, the articles by people, the authors, they're much more activists. They're much more practitioners than academics, and that was the original idea. We didn't want this to be a hijack for academics, uh, you know, in the North wanting promotion, essentially. Um, next. And, and then we started working on a number of, of publications, and this is one of them, which David May re really recognized outside the large cities with wonderful people. So again, it was a collaboration between London and, and Buenos Aires putting together works like this. Next. Um, uh, we I mustn't forget, you know, another brilliant contributor to, to the discussions about this, again because of his rigor, because of his 
his interest in, in data and, and really going into the archives and doing proper research, as opposed to a lot of the ideological research that was happening on America at the time in the 70s and 80s, which was very Marxian-oriented, but very thin on empirical evidence. This is Alan Gilbert, who I bumped into last week, by the way, and he's, 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 he's fine. He's a bit getting old, like all of us, but he's fine. So he's an important figure, but he had nothing to do with either DPU, or he was in geography here in UCL, or ID. Next, and I'm finishing soon. And then came this wonderful uh, <laughs> production of, of other books by Ardoy and David and others, you know, so, which was very, if you like, Anglo-centric, uh, uh, in many ways, but they tried to involve people like um, uh, 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 what's his name? the French guy, uh, Alain Durand Lasselle, who worked in this field, but he was also an English speaker and writer. And I think it, uh, an important catalyst in all this was Earthscan. Earthscan was the publishing arm of IID, which was launched around that time. It was run by journalists, but it, it had a wonderful publications uh, sort of a, a program, and we have them. To, we have to thank them for for actually producing, you know, all these materials and believing in people like this. I think I'll leave it there. Um, I think is there another one? No, that's it. Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, thanks so much, Julio. Uh, for that uh, rich background in terms of how the, d the debates has unfolded. So you maybe realize that I also need to expand my own, my own reading. Um, but looking forward, um, I wanted to ask David the question of where do you see uh, the debate on urbanization going now and in the future? And where should uh, the DPU prioritize its focus? You want me to respond now? If you want to, yeah. Well, the working in urban development, somehow conflict never appeared. It was seen as a responsibility of other UN agencies and that we were, you know, firmly rooted in conventional urban development. Sad is that's got to change. In a sense, all of us must work on where we can throw some light on conflict or some way of um, marking good practice in dealing with it. And of course, disaster risk reduction with climate change, the past as a guide to the future gets weaker and weaker. And I mean, it's been wonderful working with the disaster risk reduction crew and they've developed so well the skills of anticipating and pre-investing but climate change changes everything and i suppose small urban centers small urban centers depending on how you choose to um, classify them always represent a significant portion of the urban population and very often a significant portion of the the national population and when they're working well they they provide those classic public services uh, probably the tax office too, which is less popular. And in countries which have had decentralization and supported um, well, um, small urban centers, you've had the gr growth of, of cities that then grow to compete with the, the main city. So in Brazil, um, decentralization suddenly made Porto, Are Porto Alegre more attractive or Vitoria more attractive or Campinas. So you had a program for smaller urban centers that was a program for urban government. I suppose that's it. Thanks, David. David, we'll come back to you uh, towards the end of the, of the second block. So I want to now focus uh, on the second theme uh, of, of the session today, which is community-driven approaches knowledge creation by urban poor movements and partnerships with local governments, which has also been very central to, to David's work. Um, and part of DPU's mission is to enable people who are generally excluded from decision making to play a full and rewarding role in their own development. This has been a key concern in David's work and is reflected in his tireless effort 
to work with and support collectives of the urban poor and to challenge and enrich the knowledge base that is used to reach decisions and inform action. David, in collaboration with many others, has always advocated for the need for local and disaggregated data and participatory data collection processes. A very good example in da is David's effort to develop ENU, as uh, Julio also shared, into a platform for voices from the Global South, both for scholars but also particularly encouraging practitioners and civil society leaders to share insights into the perspectives and practices of those that are disadvantaged and marginalized. And that's also part of the mission of, of the DPU. <coughs> ENU constitutes a clear endeavor to challenge hegemonic Western knowledge systems and their underlying assumptions about what constitutes legitimate knowledge, what knowledge counts, and who produces it. In DPU's mission to challenge orthodox development thinking and action, EMU has played and continues to play an important role. Firstly, as an outlet for sharing alternative ways of thinking and doing, which includes supporting our partners in the Global South to write and share their work. And secondly, as a key resource for our teaching to which David contributed directly. DPU's engagement in postgraduate teaching has been very much focused on developing the capacity of future leaders and practitioners to contribute to more just and sustainable futures by challenging mainstream development agendas. Apart from David's work, often in collaboration with others, featuring heavily across module reading lists, he actively engaged in teaching at the DPU, as already mentioned by Don. And he did so most significantly within the Masters in Environment and Sustainable uh, Development, which is a program that was launched in 1997 by my colleague Adriana Allen, who is here with us today. And it's aimed at bridging theory and practice to address the world's most pressing social environmental challenges in the context <coughs> of a changing climate and uncertainty. For approximately two decades, David taught a module focused on examining environmental problems in the Global South, in which he challenged key myths and assumptions by exposing students to rich empirical evidence from the ground that offers insights into people's everyday struggles and experiences in dealing with urban environmental problems, particularly those most affected by them. But David's work further allowed him to push boundaries and challenge mainstream thinking by sharing examples of innovative approaches in community-driven processes, data collection, finance, and collaborative partnerships. Later on, he also co-developed a module focused on adapting cities to climate change with David Dotman. And this happened at a time when the climate agenda had not yet given much attention to urban areas. But more on this later in the third uh, section of, the, of this event. Working with and alongside David for many years, after having been one of his, student my, uh, his students myself, I learned a lot from him. But there are perhaps a few aspects worth emphasizing that stuck with me and are key to the ways in which we ought to engage with urban environmental trajectories and influence action. Firstly, the importance of grasping the bigger picture without developing a tendency to generalize, which underlines the need for disaggregated data and analysis. And secondly, the value of developing or strengthening one's ability to convey ideas in an accessible and concise, concise way that resonates and allows engagement with people beyond academia. I will never forget David's seminal first lecture in his module when I was a student, in which he succinctly presented the most serious environmental problems in cities of the global south as bugs and shit. A summary that he coined at an international conference in the lead up to the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio. At the same time, David continuously pushes you to unpack environmental problems in context and critically examine who is most affected and where, 
while also aiming to understand multiple contributing and underlying factors that have shaped these problems over time. These concerns continue to influence how I approach teaching and research, and David has certainly sparked and nurtured my interest in community-driven processes and alternative knowledge, which is also central to much of what we do at the DPU. I would now like to invite somebody that is much better placed than me to talk about community-driven approaches, approaches and urban poor movements and has worked with David extensively over the years. So I'm very, very happy to have Celine de Cruz with us today. Celine is an urban practitioner that started her career as a young professional working with migrant families through her NGO, the Society for the Promotion of Area Resource Centers in Mumbai. As a founding member of Slum Dwellers International, she continues to build the capacity of urban poor leaders and their organizations in Asia, Africa, and in Latin America on issues of evictions, affordable housing, and settlement upgrading. Celine is also a senior advisor to the Asian Coalition of Housing Rights and the vice president on the board of the Block by Block Foundation, which supports UN Habitat's global public space agenda. She has known and worked, David, uh, worked with David for many years in different capacities, including as a visiting fellow at IID in 2004 within their Human Settlements program. So Celine, you have known and worked with David for a long time. Can you share some insights into how you have worked together to support community-driven processes and bottom-up knowledge production? Thank you, Pascal. First of all, I'd like to thank DPU for inviting me to actually participate in the celebration of David. Well, it is with great honor that I bring lots of love and uh, lots of goodwill from many community leaders, David, today for you. And I hope I don't cry. <laughs> I met David in the early 90s in Mumbai, and uh, Sheila Patel reminded me of how I met David. She was not in the city, and she asked me and joking to manage this friend who was coming from London. And she said, you turned around and told me, why are you sending these white men to the communities? <laughs> and he was so dismissive of David. Well, that is history, and who knew that David and all of us would be walking apart together for the rest of our life and we actually had a lot to share in common with urban poor communities in the places that we work with. David taught me how to integrate local knowledge and indigenous knowledge with external knowledge. Because he was a master at the external, he knew the entire <coughs> urban development scene, he knew the language in that world. His ability to zero down into what the poorest woman said in the community and then translate it to different kinds of audiences that had influence was amazing. It was both an art and a science to see David at work. And I would never be able to do what David did, but he did teach me how to be able to bridge the gap between what local leaders and what local women were saying with an external audience. So I had, through that, I had the opportunity of not only being a visiting fellow at IIB, but I met all these friends around David, like Karen and Pascal and many others at the DPU, who invited us to talk to the students at DPU. And as one of the leaders in the Philippines, Ruby put it very well. He said the advantage of having somebody like David with us is that he's able to ground the academia with what communities really want and you know to actually expose them and to encourage them to engage with that local knowledge and i think that is the terrific thing that david has contributed to us and indirectly also to a place like dpu and it's while it's a pain to have many students come to the field at any given point of time our leaders are beginning to see the value of doing that and why that investment in the external is as important as the investment in creating their own internal knowledge. So yes, David, thank you very much for opening these doors for us, Some a path that we would have never known or experienced without you. 
the David's knowledge building was more than just knowledge building. David used that knowledge to actually transform relationships, whether it was with the local government, whether it was at, at the level of the UN, whether it was at the level of the World Bank. He, it didn't stop him from using the F word many times, but he <laughs> was able to translate the, in, in very, with, with great clarity what the poorest woman in our community actually aspired for to places where she would never be go or even to places where I would never go. And that's been a huge asset for the federations. And I'm hoping that when we don't have a David, that we have many of you sitting in this audience who will continue to play this role for us. As a follow-up question, can you tell us a bit about how David's collaborative work has contributed to bridging the gap between the urban poor and other stakeholders at multiple scales. Exactly, like a leader in uh, Zimbabwe, Sheena Magara put it very well. David listened to us very carefully and he took a long time to understand our issues. And after that, he would respond and leverage resources for us. So I think this is very telling because David was not a funder. But he used whatever power and whatever means he had to actually communicate to not only funders, but to policy makers, to local governments, to national governments, to international organizations, to leverage resources for poor communities and for these federations to strengthen their movement and build their organizational resilience. David got I don't know the amount, but I know that he was instrumental in getting lots of money for the Urban Poor Fund International. Now these were small savings groups in different cities that turned into city development funds. And the magic of, this, of these funds was that they were able to be institutionalized in some cities with local government, both in Uganda, in Cambodia, in other cities, they were able to do that. And what David did was, he, he took us up a notch and he was able to talk to the funding community and made this into an international movement where slum dwellers, our little money that meant nothing, suddenly became very powerful and it helped us to leverage lots of external resources. And not only money, but also other types of resources and professional skills and uh, knowledge, which was so important for all of us and continues to be important. David now bridges the gap for us with the climate sphere. We don't know that language. We don't know what nature-based solutions mean. We don't know what uh, circular economy means. These are all big words for us. And unfortunately, there's nobody to bridge that gap. David is doing that, but we hope all of you continue to carry that mantle. Because for us to be able to make that jump, for us to be able to deal with the inequity of land and housing in our cities and bridge that gap with climate is something that we need your help. We need professional help to do that. And we need your, uh, your wit and your knowledge and experience to help us to, to take our game to the next level. Thank you so much, yeah. Celine. I want to conclude this block by also posing a question to, to you, David. In your work, you have tried to shift the focus to the local level and emphasize the need to support collaboration between city governments, urban poor organizations, and local civil society organizations. How far do you think we have come and what challenges lie ahead? Well, we have hundreds of amazing community precedents to show what is possible. It's enormously expanded the scope of what we believe federations could do. But the issue is we're meeting some of the needs for building resilience. And going to scale. Um, but it's a funny thing, if you talk about resilience, um, my flat is resilient. It's got piped water. It's got sewers. It's got drains. It's got healthcare close by. It's got schools. It's got emergency services. It's got insurance. Got policing, which give it a, a a foundation for resilience. Which is a reminder that as we um, um, 
implement climate change adaptation, if you don't get the development stuff right, you're going to be very limited in what you can achieve. So as a priority for well, pretty much everyone working in, in, in development, how do we make sure that the funding now allocated to climate change adaptation actually goes to things that really matter? The water, the sanitation, the drainage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No, I think that's it. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think that's a great segue into this uh, third section of our program. Just, uh, my chair around it, okay. Um, so, as, we, as we've heard already, uh, DPU has long since engaged in work on uh, urban environment, and this has been a central theme in relation to DPU's teaching, research, and consultancy uh, since the inception of DPU as the Department for Tropical Architecture in 1954. But in this section of the event, this third part, uh, we're going to focus on two specific trajectories of this work, uh, that of disaster risk and urban risk, uh, which I'll touch on, and uh, on also on climate change in urban areas, uh, which David uh, talked next to me will uh, speak about as well as other things, I'm sure. Um, so I met uh, David S, as we refer to them as David S and David D in, uh, in, in DPU, uh, soon after joining DPU as a lecturer in late 2006. Um, at that time, uh, David S was already very engaged in work on uh, climate change. Uh, including uh, with the ICC, and at that point was setting up a new position in IED uh, climate change. And for David um, Anyway, David has uh, invited me to a meeting at IED with Andrew Masquerade, who's the head, who's heading the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction's Global Assessment Reports at the time. Um, and this kicked off a series of work uh, that we did together on urban risk. Um, including uh, background papers for the Global Assessment Reports in uh, 2001, 2009, and worked with him in 2011, uh, and continued to work on those. Um, a special issue for the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Society's World Disasters Report on Urban Risk. I see Mark uh, nodding his head, he also worked on that. Um, and uh, Making Cities Resilient report in 2013 uh, with Sophie Blackburn that we did um, uh, for UNDRR and um, for the Making Cities Resilient campaign and later on the uh, Urban Arc, the Urban Africa Risk Knowledge Project, which was a, a large research project looking at the intersection between urbanization, poverty and disaster risk across several African cities. Um, and David uh, brought a lot of his long-standing partners into this project, including um, Ibadun Adelikan from uh, Nigeria, Matafu, who was mentioned, from uh, Malawi, um, and the African Population and Health Research Center. This project was led by uh, Mark Helling and also included um, a lot of colleagues, including Joe De Silva from Arab, Supernel, among others. Um, David also did several guest lectures in my MSc module, Disaster Reduction in Cities, um, where he always uh, spoke about the federations, uh, about SDI, and particularly about the kinds of uh, information they produce and how they use this um, to tackle disaster risks through collective action and interactions with local governments around issues of water, sanitation, flooding, etc. So across all of these works and related to urban and disaster risk, I think there are some key contributions of David uh, that stand out for me, and I just wanted to kind of uh, lay these out very briefly. Um, and as with everything uh, in this world, I think these are not his contributions alone. They came through his interactions with a wide range of practitioners, community members, scholars, etc. But I think the first one is the focus on small and everyday risks, 
uh, which was later coined um, for UN DRR as extensive and intensive risks, um, and has since been used to develop national databases of risk um, in many countries. So this is an ongoing work. Um, this was not David's work alone, um, but alongside many others um, who, uh, and including Andrew Maskew, who championed this in UN DRR. Um, but there's a seminal publication uh, which the lead author is Bull Kamenia uh, and a number of authors um, that was published in ENU that's called From Everyday Hazards to Disasters, The Accumulation of Risk in Urban Areas. And this is where they laid out this, uh, this spectrum of risk from everyday to um, intensive and large scale disasters. I think David's work on health and environmental determinants of health perhaps pushed this focus, I'm not quite sure. Um, and for example, in Urban Arc, this led us to move towards understanding more of how smaller scale events such as localized flooding, outbreaks of cholera, malaria, and traffic accidents add to the number of death and injuries in urban areas. Um, and in fact, these end up in African cities making the majority of uh, deaths, of illnesses, and losses rather than big disasters such as cyclones and earthquakes. Um, and one other thing to point out is through David's work on urban poverty, uh, much I think he developed with Diana Midland, among others, has made uh, big contributions, I think, to unpacking the concept of vulnerability, uh, showing that vulnerability is related to multiple dimensions of poverty, for example, poor quality and often insecure hazardous overcrowded housing, inadequate and unstable income, uh, high prices paid by many necessities, etc. And on the flip side of this, David has written, and actually just speaking now, you are speaking about the concept of accumulated resilience in your flat, uh, reflecting on you know, your life in London and the services and infrastructure that uh, most people here in London have access to universally that help us to withstand a myriad of risks, but these are not always available across many low and middle income countries. Um, and a third contribution I see, and the last one I'll speak about, is David's clear perspective on what local governments can and cannot do to address risks, what communities can and cannot do and where local governments are responsible for things such as guiding where urban development occurs, regulating building and construction, regulating hazard activities that give rise to disasters like industry, whereas communities can contribute in many different ways, including small infrastructure, cleanup programs, and social safety nets, etc. So like Pascal and Don, I use a lot of David's Writing and text in my teaching, as well as papers from me and you, are very central in the reading, re, my reading lists. Um, and I think, like others have said, his clear writing style and empirical data makes his work so accessible by a wide range of students, practitioners, and scholars. Thank you. And now I move on to David Dodman. Um, lost your bio, so I'm, just going to, I'm just going to wing it. So uh, David Dodman is the director of the um, Institute for Housing and Housing and Urban Development. Okay, a different than I had. Um, a position which he took up in 2022. Uh, prior to that, he was at IED and a colleague, longtime colleague of David Satchelbrates, including uh, being a researcher and finally uh, the director of the Human Settlements Group at IED uh, from 2015 to 2022. And also, uh, he has been the title of the lead author, coordinating lead author of the IPCC um, working group. To uh, with Mark here. Uh, thank you, David, for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> so, the first question I have is How do you think David's work has influenced the debates on climate change and cities? Which is a very nice, big question. I'm going to just indulge a short preface um, to that. To, um, uh, to my own background of working with David. It was interesting to hear Julio's um, 
a description of first reading things and thinking this is someone I would want to work with. I can vividly recall first reading David's work as an undergraduate in about 1998 um, and thinking that this really pulled together some of the things that even at that stage I felt were significant around um, race, around environmental degradation but also around the serious, serious urban geography, which is how I would have probably described myself at that time. And so I was more fortunate than Julio in that 10 years later I did get to, um, <laughs> to, to work with David and got to work with him uh, for many years from 2008 um, onwards. Um, and I'm also going to just indulge one other brief thing, which is to bring greetings to the DPU on the 70th anniversary from IHS, the Institute for Housing and Urban Development Studies, Michael came to our 65th um, anniversary celebrations last year uh, when I saw that the dialogues in development were being part of the DPU 70th. I said, this is the one I want to come to. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to be, um, to be here for this one. And that's partly because David has really been uh, very influential in many of these um, important places and these important themes. And I'm going to try and um, focus a bit on the intellectual and academic side because sometimes I feel this is not the side of David's work which does um, receive the greatest attention. But as I began reflecting, I could see um, some quite significant conceptual theoretical insights which have really shaped how we engage as well. So on the climate change agenda, it was a very climate science oriented agenda. Um, the first iterations of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports, the IPCC, were very much focused on the physical drivers, the changes in the climate systems, the, um, the, the, the meteorological forcing of different um, atmospheric gases. Um, and then the first sort of wave, I think, of climate policy in response to that was very natural science based. Uh, thinking about ecosystems, but then going on thinking about things like agricultural production. But what I think David really brought to that agenda, firstly, was a sense that cities do matter. And there was very little literature or evidence on this, and I think um, what David did both pulled together relevant evidence from different sources, which is a very key intellectual skill, um, and then provided a basis on which research questions could be asked and developed and answered, uh, which is another pretty core um, intellectual and academic um, contribution. So those of you who have been speaking a couple of weeks ago would have heard these figures, but they're, they're good figures, so it's worth using them again. I looked back at the third assessment report of the IPCC um, from 2001, where David was one of the lead authors on a chapter of human settlements, energy, and industry. Um, and at that time, a fairly creditable synthesis, a 36-page synthesis with five pages of references and bibliography. By the time we got to the 2021 um, report, the sixth assessment, the chapter on city settlements and infrastructure had expanded to 145 pages, <laughs> and the bibliography was 43 pages. <laughs> Um, and um, this, I think, is in some ways testimony to the way in which people were able to build a research agenda around what David and others did 15, 20 years beforehand. A second thing, I think, in which he's done uh, really significant changes to the climate agenda um, is doing something which he's done in many other sectors, which is around challenging myths and misconceptions. Um, and I think, again, as a way of framing research, this is one fundamental entry point um, where there are widely, widely stated, widely received wisdom that needs to be tested and challenged. Because firstly, if we're building a knowledge base of something which is unfounded, we have an unstable knowledge base. And perhaps even more importantly, if we're building a policy and practice base around um, unfounded assertions, uh, we need to be correcting those. So I often think about how David did that around the sanitation agenda and challenging the assumptions in the joint monitoring program. Um, but he also did that in the climate space around things, um, including like the um, assumptions around cities being hotspots of emissions rather than hotspots of places where positive change can be, can, can be made. Um, and so these challenging of myths and misconceptions I think was very significant in this climate space as well. Thank you very much. Um, how have David's insights on adaptation, mitigation, uh, disaster risk reduction, 
Development and Sustainable Development foreseeing current directions on climate resilient development? So again, I think this shows a methodological approach that is a thread throughout a lot of his work. Um, and I see a parallel here with David's work on the Green Agenda and the Brown Agenda in the late 80s and early 90s where in many ways he came up with a unifying concept of scale to understand environmental problems in cities, not as being separate, local or global, but by using ideas of scale to integrate how actions at different scales were uh, manifest at other scales. And so a unifying concept around things that were often treated by very different groups of academics and practitioners. But I think he's done the same in the climate space around adaptation, mitigation, disaster risk reduction, and sustainable development. And I think was one of the very first people to, to do that. So the main, I think, conceptual contribution of the last IPCC report is this concept of climate resilient development, um, which I think really grew from those kinds of origins. And what's interesting in climate resilient development is it has this integrative focus, it treats governance as being a serious and critical um, element of how climate resilient development can be addressed. And it also fills issues of um, equity and justice into the debate as well. So I think all of these are things that um, began in some of the ways that um, uh, David began to think about these connections. Um, maybe it goes to two other places as well. And the first is um, the focus on locally led adaptation, which is one of the most lively policy spaces for climate change responses at the moment. Um, locally led adaptation, including in low income and informal settlements. Um, and informality and poverty were not treated seriously in the IPCC, and I'll come back to that in the next question if it's the one I think you're going to ask. <laughs> um, so um, they, were, they were not treated seriously, so locally led adaptation really draws on the, these insights as well. Um, and as do some of the current discussions around climate financing, uh, thinking about how locally led adaptation can be financed, and the, um, Celine mentioned the Urban Poor Fund. So again, this is not a brand new idea, it is an integrative and connective idea of thinking seriously about how urban development that works for low income groups can happen and seeing finance as an integral part of it, whether it's on land, housing, water, sanitation, or on climate change responses. Thank you. Um, the third question, which I think is the one you're expecting, how has uh, David's approach opened up the range of stakeholders and perspectives involved? The approach, which I think is fundamental here, is one that looks at the underpinnings around the power and politics of knowledge. Um, and again, this is something which many people in the climate domain feel that they're um, understanding or engaging with as a new issue, rather than seeing the power and politics of knowledge as being something that's fundamental to understanding, again, how urban change happens um, over time. Um, so in the latest discussions on the IPCC around the creation of a special report on cities, indigenous knowledge and local knowledge and community knowledge are very much at the forefront. Um, and I see it sort of with equal levels of amusement and frustration that these things are being brought as new ideas um, when there is so much around uh, trying to understand how what is known by people in communities as being fundamental if we're going to get communities that are more resilient and better suited and generate better livelihoods and for the people who, who live in them. And seeing this as well, not just as an end in itself, that there is some uh, uh, fundamental normative good of having this knowledge, um, but that it transforms the relationships around who can make change happen and how that's done. So that's maybe in the links with practice space, but I think in the knowledge space, the, the, the academic space, um, the practice of co-production was being done by David long before anybody knew what co-production actually was, um, and was brought into the way he approached 
um, the IPCC climate change reports, but also these you know, global assessment reports and things that um, Andrew and um, Cassidy and others have talked about. Um, bringing in authors who had direct experience, um, bringing in an evidence base, including through environment and urbanization that's generated by practitioners, and making that knowledge and evidence become available and usable um, to support global policy. So I think that was significant um, both in these global policy responses um, and also significant in how we think about some of the very wicked problems around climate change. So I was reflecting on the flooding in Nairobi, which I guess many people here would be um, aware of recently. Terrible flooding and then terrible displacement and evictions as a result of that flooding. And how can we possibly reconcile and these things which are climate change will make areas more hazard prone and less suitable for people to live in them. But local governments and national governments will always be seeking reasons to evict and force out low income groups from cities and from particular parts of cities. And I think it's only by engaging with the policies and uh, with, with the practice of creating knowledge um, and thinking about whose knowledge and realities count and can be used in the planning process, and then we can begin to untangle some of these uh, very, uh, very, very complicated issues. Great, thank you very much. Um, I have a question for David S. also, if you're there. Excellent, okay. Um, what do you see as the main challenges for urban local governments and for communities to address climate and disaster resilient development? Big question. Uh, where do you see the research in this area needs to go now? Tough question. We know we've got to anchor climate change adaptation in a development context with local government having so many key roles and grassroots organizations and federation providing examples of what is possible. I have serious doubts that the most of the funding that will now be allocated to climate change has any chance of reaching the grassroots organizations and federations and the local governments. So I think the, the, our task is to is is to, to change the financial mechanisms that support the things that give us success. And hugely important in this, as um, David D has indicated, is that the IPCC has finally got to the point where it can produce a a, a report on cities and climate change. Some people, Deborah Roberts, um, Aro Revy, among them, have been pushing for this for many, many years. And thank you, folks. I mean, it's you vastly exaggerate, but it's, but to, to be so praised is really wonderful. And I'm thank you very much. Slap it up. <laughs> well, it's it's really nice. Should we both see uh, the mic? Extraordinary person in many, many ways. And I, when I was trying to think of 
of how to encapsulate the impossibility, really. Um, I, I was thinking of three things, really. On the, on the one hand, and they're all things that have been said by, by everybody. On the one hand, David, throughout his professional life, has provided rigor with visibility for urban poor communities. And I put them together on purpose because data um, and, and this extraordinary encyclopedic knowledge that David has, that he, he mined data, you know, he really mined it out of all sources, put it together for all of us to make sense of. But at the same time, he, he reminded us that the information from urban poor communities was even more valuable than all that data, that statistical data. So, and then that was part of the rigor of understanding the urban question. And he did this in so many fields, as my colleagues have demonstrated, linking it to small and intermediate urban centers, to health. I worked with him on children many, many years ago. Um, and, and of course now his extraordinary work on, on climate change. So that rigor combined with visibility for urban poor communities I think is just a, 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 an amazing characteristic of this work. The second one is indeed something that everybody else has mentioned as well, where I always think of him in terms of providing access to knowledge, but always with an advocacy dimension to it. So yes, he provided, you know, he gave us environment and urbanization, he gave us working papers, even today, his blog series that he, he you know, is passionately putting forward. Um, but he also made he also made that access work in terms of using it as a basis for advocacy for change. And advocacy in terms of engaging with the state, with international agencies. And to, part of that is exactly what you said, David, to change the myths that people have created, uh, to create an alternative, to reconstruct a narrative about urban, uh, how people live in urban areas, ordinary people live in urban areas, um, and the kinds of strategies, not just which it, uh, innovative states were trying, but also to become aware of the strategies which poor people themselves were we're coping with, often without support from, from states. And I think the final uh, characteristic that I, I couldn't um, finish talking about David unless I mentioned is his extraordinary passion with an amazing humanity. Um, and it's here that I might cry. <laughs> um, uh, David just has that capacity to listen. I mean, if you saw David, as we often have sitting, sitting, listening to people, he sat and he listened, and he listened well. Um, and he had an ability to, to digest that listening and to then to re regurgitate it into something that could be accessible to many, many, many different people. And uh, that amazing ability uh, to communicate that listening. And, I think with that passion and, and uh, with humanity just comes what we all know of David, which is just this enormous generosity of spirit. Um, just enormous. And I, I'm just privileged to have known him, and I feel privileged that we've been able to have him as, as a lecturer in the DPU. So David, thank you from you my heart. abandoned by the state. 
Right? I, 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 this the last week I spent the entire weekend looking at the conditions of the infrastructure that I delivered as part of a team 40 years ago. And all you can see is abandonment and things deteriorating, um, unplanned development, communities becoming sort of in concrete slums. And um, how, how do you sort of measure, or is there any measurement of the progress or lack of progress in this area? I mean, we hear the metrics from, from China that they've taken 800 million people out of poverty. You go to Shanghai, and you can see where Shanghai was 50 years ago. People dying in the streets. <coughs> so the most popular, populous um, urban center in the world. And you can see, if you want to measure progress and development by the amount of whatever indicators we use, and whether the amount of multi-story buildings, or etc. But you can see a change in the physical environment. Right? Where do we have those metrics for the global south? So has, has the urban poor grown in Rio de Janeiro? Has it grown in, in Kenya? A, a, lot of, a lot of problems we have with climate change is the lack of development of infrastructure. You have infrastructure that was built to cope with runoff from 2,000 households that are now trying to cope with 22,000. Right, with, with, with the government, the city is sitting there, and then, oh, we have a crisis, right? Because the interest, there's no forward planning, there's no sort of future proofing of the infrastructure when it's put in, right? So how is, how is this catered for in your approach to development? South Africa case, right, where they talk about this growing middle class. Mm. You have 30 years, we have had no land reform. I think there's one incident where I think a Methodist church in Cape Town gave some land to the, the, the on a great, on a great, on a, on a vineyard to the, to the workers. Other than that, we have had the slums growing, we, I mean, you, you fly out of, 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 of Cape Town and miles and miles of, of, of uh, the biggest township in the world, uh, uh, you know, it, it's ridiculous. So, the, I mean, we, we gotta sort of take some of the triumphalist pro propaganda 
with a pinch of salt. Right? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think this is exactly the middle class is when they have supplanted the white middle class who fled to Europe, right? They probably worse than some of them because when you see what they, they give the workers, I mean, I, I mean, I've been, I've had the good fortune to be in down to South Africa to do work on, on some. There's no planning for for the just the electricity situation with the electricity, right? The ESCOM is struggling to deliver seven power plants, right? Because it was not designed to, to cope with all the people who now want electricity and to, to expand their factory and manufacturing and all that sort of thing. So it, it, it's we, we need to get real data. I mean, that's all data being cleaned up on the on thing. You need to get real data and, and feedback into the system. Yeah, I think you raise a very good point. And I think there's, as you say, there's no definitive kinds of data on all of these things. And uh, like what Celine was talking about, you know, what the kinds of uh, community enumerations that, uh, that SDI uh, produces is one kind of data on understanding you know, what sort of access do people have to water and sanitation, to you know, uh, ownership of plots, to different services that they have as one kind of data, which is a very powerful data. Um, you can speak about that maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but then you have, for example, like under the SDGs, countries need to report on different kinds of uh, progress that they're making towards the SDGs. And so those will more than most likely be reporting on investments that they've made and what they see as, you know, providing toilets for 10,000 people uh, or something like that. It doesn't mean that they're counting that 10,000 people are using those toilets. So it's a different side of the data, right? Um, and then, of course, you know, different countries want to publicize different things in different ways. So yeah, it, it is really, uh, a, um, it is really problematic in terms of there is no definitive kind of way of counting these things. Uh, just, just to add, uh, I think that's a very really nuanced question. So the city is divided into the formal city and informal city in the south that you are aware of. And while the city has data about the formal city, it lacks data completely about the informal city, which is 60, 70, even 80 percent in some cities like Freetown. And the Federation now is in the process of collating that data and actually systematizing it in a way that cities can benefit from it. So looking at ratios of people to toilet seats, looking at uh, the number of water taps, looking at the number of electrical points, looking at how much people pay for these services. So this is being documented by communities. It is going to take a while where we can say we have this citywide information of all informal settlements, but that's the goal. And I think most of the federations are in the process of doing that with their cities. And cities are realizing that they need that information because they don't have it. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, thank you. Just one on to, to follow up, really. The projects were mentioned and the SDGs, and I suppose one of, one of the myths is that development is a set of projects with a set of end goals rather than a political struggle and process that never ends. And Jack and Sondra and International is a great example of a set of organisations that have taken that on, and, and David's work as well, focusing, as many have today, on, on the development process rather than, say, a discrete event as, as, the, as what we should be looking at and engaging with. So, but I had a question around that, just reflecting over you know, the last 10 or 15 years on, on the health of that struggle for land rights, for uh, those living uh, lives that are excluded from power, being able to have voice and use data as a form of power. But not that the data is the end goal, but it is a process through which voice can be gained and won and brought into a position of, of influence. Um, so yeah, that's my, my question to the panel is, do we feel over the last 10 or 20, 30 years, we, there's a positive 
story of, of advance, uh, or there are some particular challenges to, to address that academics can help with. Thank you. Well, maybe, well, I realize we're I think just like governments and our presidents and prime ministers are struggling with power at that meta level, the same thing is happening at the community level. And uh, I think that's where the power of being frail, but at the same time uh, understanding that our collective is the only thing that we have as an asset to protect us, which the rich don't have, correct? And so while some sharp and enlightened leaders understand that taking the masses with you is not always easy because everybody's looking at quick fixes, including NGOs. And we're all to blame for that. You know, the next project comes, the next exciting thing, somebody's giving us 10,000, 20,000. You're ready to compromise your soul for that little money sometimes. And now everybody's running after climate. So absolutely, we need to continue to invest in building the organizational resilience of these communities. Because without that, you can bring all the other support and it's not going to work. Because whether it's an eviction, or whether it's a flood, or whether it's a disaster, a resilient community just copes better. A resilient community has less losses and damages. A resilient community can negotiate and leverage with an external environment, which a non-organized community cannot do. Yeah, so that's a good uh, Just a quick one. Thank you, Mark, for that, that question, that challenge. Um, an interesting one. A few years ago, there was um, an election in Bogota, Colombian capital, and uh, one of the uh, candidates who was left-wing candidate kept talking about the poor and uh, trying to appeal to the poor from the left, as you know, the usual position of the left. And actually, he didn't get many votes. The reason is the poor don't feel poor anymore in, in many Latin American cities. They feel that they've overcome that because they now have a um, degree of security of tenure, which wasn't the case, you know, in the earlier years, what I, the books I was showing, you know, with John Turner's time. They have security of tenure, they have now building of their heads. In most cases, it's owned, but, it, you know, 40% is, is rented. Um, they have now possession, physical possessions, assets, as Caroline Moses' work has, has demonstrated. And they're no longer feel poor in that sense. They feel asp aspirational and middle class. So a lot of the political struggles that we saw in the 70s that I was sort of watching and, and witnessing very, very close by have disappeared to a large extent. You don't have organized land invasions, uh, which were organized politically often by the Communist Party, because people now have a market to go to. And this is what the, the, the whole thing has pushed, is people to go to the market and you know, sort out your problems through subsidies and many other mechanisms. So, so I think that in a way, that, that, that there's a degree of apathy and people are essentially coping with urban life, coping with traveling long distances to, to, for jobs, uh, whether formal or informal, uh, they're, they're taking their kids to school, and that sort of everyday struggle is what I could see in, in Latin American cities. And, and, but you know, it's interesting that you know, we see them as poor, and not, you know, often statistically <coughs> sure that we see them as poor. But the reality is in many cities, the mechanisms are there to help and provide a support. I'm, I'm thinking of Bogota, which is a city that I've worked on more um, over my life. Um, but it may be an explanation of why a lot of these uh, struggles that you were referring to uh, have dissipated in a way. Thank you for the question. It's an interesting but also challenging one. I like to be optimistic, so I would hope that we have made some some progress. But I think building on what Julio said, what is also important is to consider particular contexts. I don't think it's useful to generalize. And again, that's something that, you know, I'm definitely taking from having been taught by and having worked with, with David and, and what, what we continue in our teaching of the module that David used to teach is to actually say, okay, let's look at what's happening in a particular context and what are perhaps some of the innovations and inspirations that we can 
build on, and it's always a question do we look at the glass half empty or glass half full? And I think we should focus on the latter and actually see what ingredients are there to further push for, for transformation. Thank you. Um, I'm actually just going to take this opportunity to uh, close our session. David Dobbinson has no more comments. Uh, <laughs> um, and a big thank you to uh, all of our uh, speakers here today, especially uh, to Celine and David, who traveled uh, to David Sanchez-Wade for putting up with us for several months of pestering him about this event. Uh, so I hope it wasn't too cringy. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you very much to uh, Alban and to Alex behind the scenes um, doing the technical work and to our audience for joining us. I hope that you can stay for a drink. We have cold drinks and little nibbles and things like that. So looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.